Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, the government officially lifting practically all domestic coronavirus restrictions as daily infection numbers hold in the single digits. Opposition head Yair Lapid and Yamina Party Chair Naftali Bennett getting closer and closer to finalizing a government. And as part of ceasefire negotiations with Israel, Hamas providing its own demands for a likely prisoner swap agreement. Well over a year has now passed of global lockdowns, quarantines, changing restrictions, and most unfortunately, heartbreaking death tolls. Yet in Israel, at least, as of today, essentially all COVID restrictions have been lifted. The national infection rate failing to, falling to practically nil just six months after the start of Israel's leading vaccination campaign. Effectively, this means that apart from wearing masks indoors and maintaining certain restrictions on foreign visitors, there will be no more limits on groupings of people indoors or outdoors. All restaurants, public amenities, etc. will be opened to full capacity regardless of vaccination status. And both the green and purple ribbon qualifications for opening businesses have been abolished. Again, though, as I mentioned earlier, some restrictions will remain to keep infections from rising again. And here to discuss is Professor Nadav Davidovich from the Department of Health Systems Management at Ben Gurion University. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, first off, before we get to the limited restrictions, we've heard from several experts that it's too soon to lift all of these measures, especially those of the Green Pass. Do you agree? Uh, I think that uh, this is the right time of doing this. Uh, the rates are extremely low. Probably we almost got into herd immunity. Uh, I think also that uh, since we are very close to have vaccination for children, uh, for me it's better that uh, without uh, the Green Pass uh, we can uh, move ahead and uh, those who are against uh, vaccines, anti-vaxxers, won't say that there was uh, unnecessary pressure. Uh, we had maybe a few number of cases every day. This is almost... Uh, a dream, you know, comparing to several uh, months ago. Of course, the situation is extremely different around the globe mm -hmm. because of the uh, gap in vaccination rates. Especially, this is alarming uh, the Palestinian Authority because it's our interest to have them uh, vaccinated and we don't want to have variants uh, formed. So the main uh, challenge now is outside of Israel, mm -hmm. especially at the airport and the crossing borders. All right, well, you already touched on some of these issues, but right now there are three steps specifically that Israel is taking to keep outbreaks to a minimum amidst the newly restored freedoms, uh, including protocols for isolating and testing new cases and members of their community, particularly schools, restrictions on international visitation through Ben-Gurion uh, ben Airport, like requiring negative COVID tests uh, within three days of arrival, quarantining for individuals coming from high-risk areas, et cetera, and finally, as you mentioned, potential, uh, a potential ruling on vaccinating kids aged 12 to 15, making for another 800,000 or so inoculations. First of all, I'll start with the children. Do you think it's necessary to mandate a, a child vaccination? Uh, or is it enough to maybe leave to individual parents' uh, decisions? Do we have enough vaccinations as is to, to play fast and loose with, with children? And are the other tenants, for that matter, enough to keep the infection rate low? I think uh, it's a uh, right of uh, children and their parents who want to be vaccinated to have access. I don't think we need uh, a campaign like we did several months ago when the situation was uh, much worse. And we need to remember that uh, more than 200,000 Israelis that are above the age of uh, 50 that are much more in a high risk. So uh, that's something that we need to invest much more energy. Uh, we see the indirect effect of the vaccine. The question if we are already in herd immunity or almost there, I think it's uh, uh, mainly theoretical. Practically, we are almost in herd immunity. But again, uh, in terms of priorities, I would put more emphasis on um, persuading those who are above 50. Uh, for children, um, I have a 
son who is uh, 14 years old. I'll be very happy to have him vaccinated. He will be happy. And also we need to remember that there are some families that want to travel abroad, or maybe there are people that are immunocompromised at their home. So I think we need to leave it as a personal uh, decision, family uh, decision. There is no urgent, uh, you know, situation that, uh, uh, like it was uh, several months ago in January, it was a horrible month, for example. And then uh, we need to persuade everybody. Now we are in a very different situation. All right, Professor Nadav Davidovich, thank you so much for your insights. Thanks a lot. In other major news, opposition leader Yair Lapid and Yamina party head Naftali Bennett getting closer and closer to signing a landmark power-sharing agreement. The two reportedly hoping to present a viable coalition to President Rivlin by Tuesday night, just 24 hours before the deadline to do so. Yeshatid party leader and Knesset opposition head Yair Lapid saying there's still plenty of work to be done in forming a unity coalition. Yet both Lapid and partner Naftali Bennett are adding that they're optimistic that they can present a coalition proposal to President Rivlin within a day or so and have a government sworn in within a week. Lapid also promising an allegedly brighter and more responsible government than that of his predecessors. אם תקום הממשלה הזו, מילת המפתח תהיה אחריות. לקחת אחריות. להחזיר את השקט הפנימי, לא להאשים אחרים, לא לחפש אויבים, לא להגיד שכל מי שחושב אחרת מאיתנו הוא בוגד וצריך להרוג אותו. גם אם ליש עתיד היו 40 מנדטים, זו הממשלה שהייתי מקים. ימין, שמאל ומרכז. ממשלת אחדות, ממשלה שתדאג לכל אזרח ישראלי Prime Minister Netanyahu, however, still working until the last second to undermine the would-be government, posting polls that highlight voter dissatisfaction and calling on Bennett to hold out for a right-wing bloc. Then to let potential angers simmer, Likud member Yeriv Levine allegedly planning to use his powers as Knesset speaker to delay a vote of confidence for up to a week after the coalition plans are submitted. Bennett and Lapid, however, maintaining their cool, saying progress is being made with all relevant parties, including the Islamist Ram. And Bennett earlier dismissing chances for a right-wing coalition based on numbers alone, the pro-Netanyahu bloc failing to reach 61 mandates, even with Bennett alongside them. And joining me now with more on the potential new unity government, I'm happy to welcome back Israeli political analyst Orly Rapaport. Orly, thanks so much for being Hello, with us. Hello, good to be back. Hi, Aaron. Good to see you. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to start with Lapid sources from Yeshatid saying that progress was made with all the parties that will be part of the coalition, including with the, the Islamist Ram, United Arab List Party of MK Mansour Abbas. So given the fact that many, many different parties of, from the right all the way to the, to the left with very different opinions are joining in this unity government. Do you think that it will be effective? Um, it's, it's very hard to say. On the other hand, we live here all together, so many different people for so many different places and with the Arabs and with the religious and with the right and with the left. And we somehow have to get along. If we don't uh, see our government uh, and our members of the government and the Knesset doing the same, uh, I don't think it can come down to the people, and which is what everybody is hoping for in a way. So I hope, I hope it will work. Let's be optimistic. So I mean, because the contrary to that, we've heard actually from many people speaking when we've spoken about this. We've heard from some saying that there's no way they'll be able to get anything done given the drastically different opinions. And then we have others who say that, no, actually, this will be a very stable government because they've agreed to put certain things aside and focus on what they do agree on. Where, where do you see those agreements? So, so first of all, we have to say that Biden is uh, the president of the United States. In terms of what will happen in Israel, uh, there will be no annexation. There will be no many uh, units being built in the in Samaria. These are things that are going to be stopped anyway. So if we put that aside and focus on the internal things in Israel, like the economy, uh, like transportation, and many other things that need to be invested in, there is a way that this could work and actually be good. It all depends on the willingness of all sides to work together. Right now, to form the government and to see uh, Netanyahu leave is something that is 
joined to almost all the parties in this and uh, not being interested in going to the fifth election because most of them know that they will not come out good as they did or as good as they did. And on the other hand, there will be no change. So they do want it to work. And I feel that in a place where people want things to work, they usually work. You see it between couples. You see it when people want to make deals together, uh, when signing contracts, when there's goodwill from all sides, things can work. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned couples and, and sort of finding ways to, uh, to come to terms with one another, because we've actually seen reports of trouble in paradise between Bennett and Lapid already with respect to who will go first in, in leadership as prime minister. Lapid reportedly saying that legally speaking, because Bennett has so few votes, he can't be first prime minister. President Rivlin already saying uh, that it, that's it wasn't, nonsense. It wasn't actually Lapid. It uh. was the Likud party saying that because they mm. wanted to break the deal that is happening right now. They wanted to legally try to break it while the legal counselor of the president said that actually it can be done. So it's the Likud uh, party again trying to fail this government in which all sides that are going to this government, not to put a few people that are not very happy about it, but will go for it because it is what it is at this point, uh, meaning Ayelet Shaked, by the way, and parts of the Yamina party. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like this is going to happen, like we predicted, by the way, right before the war, right, Aaron? That's, that's true. All right. This exact conversation. So, all right, so my final question for you then is, if, Le if Likud under Netanyahu actually does end up in the opposition, what do you think the future holds for Likud? I think there will come a point where when Netanyahu will need to be switched by someone else who is uh, a little bit more accepted by the public in Israel. I think that the Likud party has good things about it. I think that Netanyahu made many mistakes to make people who work around him uh, and worked with him before not want to be there with him. You, uh, by the way, when speaking about this uh, forming government, I think the only person to blame is not Bennett for going with uh, Lapid or the other way around. It's Netanyahu for not letting Naftali Bennett and Ayelet Chake join the Likud party when they wanted to. It's uh, mm. pushing Gidon Saar out when he was top positions in the primaries in the Likud party instead of giving him a minister uh, position. He actually made him be a Haver Knesset, a member of the Knesset. He pushed people away instead of keeping them close, and now it's coming back to him. All right. And if I may, one more thing about the poll that you showed about 61% sure. of the people uh, who voted for Yamina that not that wanting, right. voted for Yamina and supposedly will not, are not, don't want them to go with, yeah. uh, with uh, Yeshatid party. Uh, the first poll that they made, it was 73%. The second poll is 61 percent. So you're you know saying they're coming to terms with and, this. And it, not only coming to terms, you don't always know the real situation with the polls. You can get to all the people. Uh, I did my own calculations, and we spoke about it also before. I don't think that it's more than two mandates that are upset with uh, Bennett going uh, with Yeshatid. The only thing is that these votes are... Uh, like the, the people are louder, are more opinionated and louder Since than the ones who, uh, instead of Gantz, voted for uh, Bennett this time. All right. And I know quite a few of them. Oli Rappapol, thank you so much as always. Good to see you all. Have a good, good evening. Bye-bye. Moving on, Hamas and Israeli leadership still trying to come to terms via Egyptian mediation following the latest 11-day war between Israel and the Gaza-based terror group Hamas last month. Negotiations possibly hitting a snag, however, on details of a prisoner swap included in the ceasefire. Israel requesting the return of two IDF soldiers' bodies and two apparently cognitively impaired civilians held by Hamas since 2014 and 2015, while Hamas demanding, among others, the return of incarcerated Palestinian terrorist and political leader Marwan Barghouti. Barghouti, who is serving five life sentences plus 40 years in Israeli prison for the murder of four Israelis and a Greek Orthodox priest, during the second intifada between 2000 and 2005. So what will come of these negotiations? Joining us with the analysis is Dr. Eli Carmon, senior researcher at the Institute for Counterterrorism at the IDC Herzliya. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, would Israel consider releasing Baruti? Good afternoon. Uh, personally, I think it will be a good idea because uh, for the moment there is no real uh, successor to Abu Mazen. 
Uh, Barghouti is known, by the way, in the past was considered to be moderate, and he passed a lot of time in uh, Israeli prison. Uh, I think that, uh, like other leaders of the PLO, and especially of Fatah, we were in Israeli prison. In the end, they were much more moderate than other uh, uh, organization prisoners, for the instance, uh, Hamas, clearly, and also the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. Uh, and this would be some uh, good uh, news for uh, the Palestinian Authority, because uh, they would prefer to see him free and not uh, uh, important people from the Hamas. So do you think that this might and actually... Do you think that this might I mean, actually Israel, bring yeah. Israel and the Palestinian Authority closer together? I think that uh, there is need for a negotiation. Uh, and uh, this is actually the, the position of the American uh, administration of Egypt, of the European Union. And I think also if the new government uh, uh, of Shinui will be in power, I think there are more, more, more elements in this government which accept and think that a new negotiation must be begin with the Palestinian Authority. It's not negotiation for peace immediately, but uh, to try to change the situation, to improve the situation, to stabilize the relationship between the Israel and the Palestinians, and trying to uh, weaken Hamas in Gaza, because all the other actors, though all these actors are interested in weakening Hamas, and especially on the military level. Uh, and this is, by the way, one of the main uh, issues on the table during these negotiations. Will Hamas rearm? Will uh, the international community, Egypt and Israel, give them the uh, necessary financial means, like uh, we did with the Qataris, to have money and uh, reconstruct their arsenal, which was destroyed uh, in part, at least, by IDF? Uh, so I think this uh, will be the main issues on the table in the negotiations in which the Egyptians have a critical uh, role. By the way, the Egyptians want to uh, be active partners in the reconstruction of Gaza. They say we give half a billion dollars in order to be inside this, uh, wow. this uh, uh, project. And they want the Palestinian Authority to be involved. And the President Biden said the money will arrive only through the Palestinian Authority. All right. Well, I think it'll be very interesting to see how these negotiations progress then. Dr. Kawon, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. Speaking of Iran-backed proxy groups now, Lebanese and Arabic media sources reporting some very serious news. Though still speculative, the reports are alleging that Hezbollah terror chief Hassan Nasrallah has died Monday night of coronavirus. The speculations beginning last week with rumors of Nasrallah's hospitalization during a virtual media blackout and Nasrallah's emerging from the blackout to give a speech against Israel actually only reinforcing the rumors of his illness. The Lebanese terror leader looking pale while coughing and occasionally struggling for breath throughout the whole address. And finally now, rumors continuing with Nasrallah's apparent demise. But again, all that said, this is far from the first time Nasrallah has been rumored to have died, and no official reports have been released. Additionally, Lebanese paper Al Jumhuria claiming that Nasrallah simply recovering from a bout with allergies and pneumonia. Now, in other news, the wake of, in the wake of the latest conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, some semblance of calm seemingly returning to Jerusalem, this including the resumption of organized tours to the Temple Mount complex, believed to be the holiest site on earth for the Jews and the third holiest site in Islam. A group of a few dozen Jewish visitors recently filmed walking quietly through the complex with police escort, given how the site is often a flashpoint for violence. Several Western media outlets, however, presenting the visit more like this. 50 Jewish settlers backed by heavily armed Israeli police storm Al-Aqsa compound and occupied East Jerusalem. A headline only later deleted and amended after Honest Reporting responded with a tweet of their own, reading, Translation, 50 Jews peacefully visit Judaism's holiest site, escorted by police for their own protection. Of course, Al Jazeera English is far from the only apparently biased critic of Israel, reporting half-truths and whole lies in pursuit of anti-Israel agendas. The New York Times, for one, continuing its tradition of attacking the Jewish state by sharing fake victim photos, covering up victims' ties to terror groups, publishing propaganda maps as art, and excusing, if not outright ignoring, Hamas's terror tactics. Meanwhile, the BBC, among several others, just as bad, repeatedly blasted for decades of alleged systematic hostility towards Israel. Here in the studio to discuss, media analyst with Honest Reporting, Emmanuel Miller. Emmanuel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right, so my first question to you is, you know, while I know that you've documented tons of this type of media, I, I want to focus for a moment first on the BBC, actually. What is the proof that Honest Reporting has for its allegations of decades of bias? 
Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> and to be honest, there's plenty of individual examples of reports. We can talk about what's happened now the, over the war, over this operation, in which there were many reports that started the story from the middle. So, for example, at the beginning, we know that there were attacks on Jews. And the, that was called the, the, in, uh, the Intifada, the TikTok Intifada, in which Arab youths were recording videos of random attacks on Jewish uh, civilians, uploading it to TikTok for, for likes. And, and uh, that was what provoked a, a Jewish reaction. And then things spiraled from there, one could say. But that didn't appear at all in many reports. And that, that the, uh, the, uh, the attacks on Jews by Arab youths was something that wasn't even recognized and therefore readers at home wouldn't even know about it. And there were similar things, for example, we have the, uh, the Temple Mount crisis later on, and that was often framed as an Israeli incursion into the Temple Mount, into Al-Aqsa. And in reality, it was a response to rock throwing and um, missiles and fireworks being used as missiles, um, terribly dangerous things that any police force around the world would need to stop. But when you start the story from the middle, people don't understand what's happening. So, so let's maybe give credit where credit is due. How much of the BBC's reporting on Israel is legitimate? It's a tough question as well. I, I would say that if you're talking about individual details, they don't, it's not an organization that lies. It's not pure um, propaganda like we had that tweet from Al Jazeera. No, they don't call Jewish um, pilgrims uh, settlers and they don't say that they are storming Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's not, it's not that bad. However, we were alerted to a tweet by a Twitter account called Nasha Jew, which exposes anti-Semites and Holocaust deniers around the world, specifically in Britain. And this reporter was working in Ramallah at the time of the last war, 2014. And she tweeted, Hitler was right. And she also tweeted some other horrible things. For example, during um, a terror attack um, in Hanof in Jerusalem, um, she also dismissed anti-Semitism. You, you said horrible things that no reporter should ever say. And then she was later hired by the BBC. Um, three years after that, she was hired by the BBC. And then in the latest round of reporting, she was involved in the very making of the news that we were able to see around the world. So she was responsible for a report that attacked celebrities for not speaking out enough about the, uh, um, yeah. All right, well, so I was just going to say, I understand that there's actually... Uh, an internal report or an investigation in the BBC of bias. Yes. Where, where is that? Because that was commissioned in, what, 2004? 2004, so there was the Balin report. In the Second Intifada, there were many complaints about bias at the BBC. And it came to a point where they commissioned a report that was filed in 2004 and promptly buried. Um, allegedly, amongst the 20,000 words of this um, long report, um, there were so many damning facts in there that the BBC felt it had to um, to hide this report and it spent something like five hundred thousand dollars three hundred thirty thousand pounds um, in legal fees despite the fact this is a publicly funded body and it owes the um, the public transparency it's declined to make the findings of the report public all right well so I want to stop for just a second thank you so much Emmanuel Miller for joining us, and if you'd like to learn more about the BBC report and all the work that Honest Reporting is, do, is doing, please go to honestreporting.com. And for the extended interview with Emmanuel Miller, go online to our YouTube and to our Facebook account. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast with Hannah Rifkin. How exciting. Summer is officially here. And summer is all about the beach here in Tel Aviv. Good thing we've got perfect weather for it. Now looking at tonight, lows will be in the 60s for the most part, or rather teens and Celsius. And then tomorrow, highs will reach temperatures in the 70s and 80s or 20s and Celsius. A big cool down from the past few days. And now back to the studio with Aaron. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.25 shekels to the American dollar and 2.7 shekels to the Canadian dollar. And finally, for the latest updates and news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as to our newsletter at ILTV.tv. I'm Aaron Porras. Be well, and thank you so much for watching.